This presentation is about the Marsh Tacky Horse. Marsh Tacky is a little known horse in South Carolina, but a very important horse to our South Carolina history. It is now the State Heritage Horse. It became the State Heritage Horse in 2010. I am the Secretary of the Carolina Marsh Tacky Association, and we are working to preserve the horse and to keep the line going for future generations. And this is a presentation about the history of the horse and what we are doing to conserve the breed. The Marsh Tacky um, came here about 500 years ago with the Spanish. It was an Iberian horse, also called the Spanish horse or the Spanish jennet. They brought them over on ships. As you see, they were offloading them from the ships and they would place them around on islands so that they wouldn't have to keep up with them and feed them. Then they could come back later and get the horses and use them whenever they needed them. They deposited some of these horses on Hilton Head Island in the early 1500s. Spanish horses were also used by Native Americans along the trade routes. There was a deerskin trade. Some of the Native Americans, the Seminole Indians in Florida, would take some of the deerskins, put them on the horses, and bring them up to Charleston to sell. They would sell the deerskins, and they would also sell the horses, and then walk back home on foot. And the horses were traded by the Indians, also with the English and the Indians, the Chickasaw, Creek Indians, and Choctaw tribes. Characteristics of the Marsh Tacky, a lot of them have some of the colonial markings. You see the uh, shadowing on the shoulders, also the dorsal stripe down the back, and there's some zebra stripings on the legs. A lot of the horses still carry those markings. They come in a variety of colors. These are the, the bays. Those are my two horses, Yago and River, Broya. There's a black, black is more rare. And there are a couple of different roan colors. This was a pretty blue roan and a red roan. Confirmation, they are a small horse. They're in between pony and regular horse size, around 14 to 15 hands. Their head is well-defined. They have a wide space between their eyes. Their chests are narrow. Their back is short and well-coupled. They have a sloping hindquarter, see how the, the tail hangs low off the back? It's a low set tail. They're very proportional. You may see in some news reports things that I don't like, like they are sway back, short leg, big headed. I'm fighting all of those. <laughs> they have a great disposition and a great nature. They're level headed, they're sure footed. These are thinking horses. A lot of horses just react. Marsh tacky horses think. For a marsh tacky, the top thing for them is their safety and the safety of their rider. So when something happens, they think about it first. They don't just panic. These animals are woods friendly. They've grown up in the woods. They've had to survive on their own. When earlier civilizations perished, these marsh tackies were alive. They were able to beat the odds and stay alive. They could just live off brush. Swamp savvy. They have a unique ability to get out of swamps. Other horses may get stuck in the swamps, like in fluff mud, and they'll panic and get themselves bogged down more. And I've seen this happen. Marsh tacky gets stuck in the mud. It lies on its side, pulls its feet out, and then crawls out of it. They're easy keepers. A lot of people say they never need a farrier. I'm having a farrier check mine because all my animals are spoiled. You can just put them out in the pasture and they, they can live on forage. The horses these days are a little bit bigger than they used to be because most of them get grain and, and better feed now. We found out that marsh tackies have a unique gait. Dr. Molly Nicodemus at Mississippi State University studied the gait of the marsh tacky and found that it was different than all other horses. And she allowed us to name the gait. So we had a contest to name the marsh tacky gait and we settled on the Swamp Fox Trot. And that's a nod to Francis Marion, who used these horses in the Revolutionary War. So marsh tackies were used to defend our state in times of war. Francis Marion and his troops used the horses. They were the common horse in the area. Francis Marion's troops usually brought their own equipment and their own horses. Within those horses, there were a lot of marsh tackies. And it was said that if you wanted to save your horse during the Revolutionary War, the best place for them was with Francis Marion because he protected his horses. They were also used by the British troops. When they ran short on their horse supply, they would steal marsh tackies and some of their horses were lost at sea and they came to Charleston and stole some marsh tackies there too. 
But usually the British horses were big. They couldn't get through the swamps the way the marsh tackies could. Usually Francis Marion used the horses for just quick retreats or getting places quickly. They rarely fought on horseback. But it was easy to take these horses places. You didn't have to carry grain and other feed for them. They, they were easy to use. They were quiet. They didn't panic. I read about some horses being taken off Hilton Head in the night, and they were all very quiet. They, they just seemed to know. And also their coat colors blended in with the low country terrain. That's another thing that helped them to get away and to hide. And this is an example. You can see the gruelly color blended in with the sand, whether it was gray or, or brown. And also it's really hard to see these horses. You can see the orange hunting vests, but it's hard to see the horses in the brush, low country brush. They were also used in the Civil War, specifically by the Citadel Cadet Rangers. The cadets were in school at the time. The Citadel told them that they could not go and join the war. They disagreed. They thought they were missing out on all the action. So a group of Citadel cadets left and formed the Cadet Rangers. And this was their captain, Moses Bimbo Humphrey. Later, in the Battle of Virginia, he was wounded and so was his horse. And he eventually died of his injuries. And his horse, Yago, died of his injuries too. And legend has it that they were buried together in the same grave. In World War II, marsh tackies were used as beach pounders. There was a station on Hilton Head Island for the coast. They would patrol the shores looking for U-boats. At first, the horses were issued by the Army. Later, horse supply ran low, so they were asking locals to bring their horses. And a lot of those were marsh tackies. And they were also used in times of peace. They were the main mode of transportation in the low country. People used them for just about anything. They would take families to church, kids to school. They were used for plowing, for herding. The mailman would take a marsh tacky. Even the undertaker would, you know, take you to the grave in the marsh tacky. So they, they were used for just about everything. They've been called the all-terrain vehicle of the time. <laughs> and this is, top picture is, um, a member of the Marsh Tacky Association. She grew up with Marsh Tackies on Wadmala Island. That's a picture of her when she was younger. And someone else sent me a picture that she used to compete on her Marsh Tacky. And this is an older one that we found in the archives. You hear about them used as just regular everyday all-terrain vehicles. They were also used a lot by the Gullah community. They were very important to the Gullahs. But they were also used by the wealthy. And this is Ver Bernard Baruch. And he was a wealthy financier and advisor to presidents and other politicians. He had come to his plantation, Hobcaw Barony. And they would, they would hunt there. He also owned racehorses that he raced at Saratoga. But his favorite horses were the Marsh Tackies, and those he used for hunting. Author Havila Babcock wrote that the finest hunting mounts he had ever ridden were the tacky ponies owned by Bernard Baruch at Hofkall Barony. And in 1843, John James Audubon wrote about marsh tacky, saying that marsh tacky stand the fire of the gun and not only go with tolerable speed, but are tough as a pine knot. And a little known fact was that Frank Lloyd Wright built stables for marsh tackies when he built Old Brass. This is his only plantation, the southern plantation. He was asked to build it. He had one set of stables for large horses and he built another set of stables, smaller stables for the marsh tackies. We'll see the complex is designed with hexagonal shapes and 80 degree inward sloping walls. <laughs> this is kind of unique. Joel Silver bought the plantation, you know, the director of Die Hard and Matrix movies in 1986 for $148,000. And he's repairing it to the original state. A couple times a year, he lets people come in and tour. The marsh tackies are now critically endangered. There used to be thousands of them on the sea islands. Anytime somebody needed a marsh tacky, all you had to do was get your barge, go over to a sea island, get the horses that you needed, bring them back. They were easy to train, easy to keep. Farmers could train them to plow, do whatever work they needed them to do. Then they could take them back and put them on the island. 
and then come back again next time they needed horses and get some more. But when construction came, tractors came, bridges, cars, they started taking horses off the island. Especially when golf courses came, because the horses messed up golf courses. So they wanted all the wild horses off the island. Mr. D.T. Lowther, the president of the Marsh Tacky Association, went over and got a lot of these horses because he'd always loved them and still has very many of them. A lot of the horses that were taken off the islands were bred with other horses and lost their, their heritage that way. And this is a, a group of wild horses from Mr. Lowther's farm. And this is Mr. D.P. Lowther. He grew up with the horses, had them all his life. His father had them before him. They've had them for over 100 years. He is very adamant about keeping this breed safe, keeping them pure, and continuing the breed well into the future. But he is the main reason that we have marsh tackies. Of the 300 marsh tackies that are left, Mr. Lowther has 100 of them. It's just because he's always loved the breed. There are other breeders that have marsh tackies. These are some of the families that are essential in the survival of the breed. And they, like Mr. Lowther, kept the marsh tackies as they were just because they loved the breed. Ricky and Tammy Warren are some of the major breeders. Mr. Lee McKenzie is a virtual encyclopedia about marsh tackies. He remembers every horse and every horse's name. If you ever need to know anything, ask Mr. McKenzie. Marion Gohagen has been breeding marsh tackies all of his life and he uses them from hunting and has his own hunting business. And Jennifer Ravenel and her father bred marsh tackies all their life along with many other people in their family. The Ravenel family was big into marsh tackies. And now we have new breeders which is what we need for the survival of the breed. We need more people to come in and Take these horses, raise them, breed them, and help us continue to keep them going. MJ Goodwin heard about the Marsh Tacky breed, went down to Mr. DP's farm, fell in love with them, and now she's one of our major breeders, and she's got 12 Marsh Tackies right now in Anderson. So we're spreading them out across the state, which is also good. John Spicinger is a member of the Wasamasaw tribe Indians, and he grew up with Marsh Tackies on John's Island and was talking to his son about the horses. They had other horses. He said he really wanted to find that little swamp pony he used to know when he was growing up. So his son got on the internet and was looking around and found the Marsh Tacky Association. He took his dad out to see them and he said, that's exactly it, they're still here. So now they're, they're some of our newer breeders. Marion Broach heard about the Marsh Tackies, read about them in an article. He's now a major breeder. He sold all of his Harley-Davidson motorcycles and got Marsh Tackies. And we have David Grant, who found out about Marsh Tackies through hunting and got a few, fell in love with the breed. And now he has his own TV show and his own company, Marsh Tacky Outdoors. But we are in need of more people to breed the horses and to raise the horses and keep them safe. We do have help. We've got the American Livestock Breeds Conservancy that has agreed to take on our stud book, which includes all the horses that have passed and all the ones that are alive. They keep a list of horses that die and new ones that are born and which horses are gelded. So anytime we need any advice about breeding or to find out where certain horses are, the American Livestock Breeds Conservancy has all that information. They found out about the Marsh Tacky through the Florida Cracker Association they told them that there were similar horses in South Carolina. So they came up and checked it out and they helped us get the breed association started because they realized something needed to be done to um, save the breed. All of the horses that are in our, our breed book have been DNA tested, so they are pure marsh tackies. So DNA analysis has been done. Um, other colonial Spanish horses are Florida Cracker horses and the Shackleford Banks horses in North Carolina. They're all related. These are all different strains of the colonial Spanish horse breed. So current uses of marsh tackies, they're used a lot for hunting. Their heads are low, so it's easy to sit on them and you can shoot directly across their heads. They're used a lot for recreation. I've heard of some people using marsh tackies for dressage. And competitive trail riding is a new thing. A lot of our members are, are into the competitive trail riding. 
where you go and you have certain obstacles. And marsh tackies are pretty good at this because they don't spook very easily. They're easy to train for that. Beach racing is a big thing that we do now, but it's also a thing of the past. And in the past, people would race their horses on the beach after the harvest. It was a kind of a last hurrah of the season. Everyone would take their horses out to the beach and race, and it was just for bragging rights and just for fun. And that ended around the 1960s when they started taking horses off the beach. And we thought it'd be fun to bring it back, and, and it has been. It's become a popular event. This was in 2009. This was our first race on Mitchellville Beach. And it was interesting trying to find a beach to race horses on because <laughs> most beaches don't allow horses anymore. And Hilton Head wanted us to race there, but there was a problem. We couldn't race because horses weren't allowed on the beach. But we found this little loophole that Mitchellsville Beach was not technically categorized as a beach. So we were able to take the horses there. We were expecting 300 people. It wasn't very well advertised, but we're surprised to find out that we had 3,000 people show up to shut down the roads of Hilton Head. <laughs> it was amazing. So the next year, we talked to the Hilton Head Council, and they decided to change the ordinance and allow us to run on Caligny Beach, which was a bigger beach, a lot more room for people in parking. And that year we had 5,000 people show up. And we started getting a, a gathering of tacky hat ladies. And they've shown up at the races every year. And they, they just have a good time, wear their tacky hats. And we've started to have a contest now for the tacky hats. And the Mars Tacky Cup winner that year, this was in 2011, was a horse named Molly. She was the oldest horse on the beach, she's 22 years old, and had one of the youngest riders. Brittany was 19 riding her then and she beat all the younger horses. And this is a picture of Molly, Molly in the lead. So in 2013, we took the horses to Defusky Island, which is like a, a completely new experience. With no bridge, we had to barge the horses across to the island. A lot of people said that was their favorite part, is just taking the horses back to the island because they used to be plentiful there. It was a gorgeous setting, weather was right, and put on a pretty good race. So, this is the journey to the state horse. This is kind of where I came in to the picture. <laughs> I worked at, in the government documents department at Winthrop University in the Dacus Library. I, I saw all the legislation coming across my desk. In 2005, there was a bill to make the Mars Tacky the state horse. Perfect. It was the only one that could be the state horse. I'd loved these horses all my life. <laughs> I started in third grade when I was writing about South Carolina history. And I'd read all of the Marguerite Henry books about Misty Chincoteague and just loved those. And I was working in the library then. I worked there for <laughs> since I was a kid. But I was talking to my librarian and I said, I wish that South Carolina had horses on the islands like North Carolina. And she said, well, we do, but not many people know about them. So I got really excited and I went home and told my parents and we'd been to see the North Carolina horses. So they took me down to the Charleston area to look around for marsh tackies and we did find some. Um, that, that, at that time, they were tied outside people's houses and my dad, who would talk to just about anybody, got out of the car and was talking to people about the horses and I got to see them and pet them. And <laughs> I came back and wrote about them in my South Carolina paper, even though they weren't you know, a state symbol yet. <laughs> and as it turned out, my, my project won first place and was put in the library on display, but was stolen. So <laughs> I wish I had that. I, I wish I still had it because my mother kept about it everything. But I read about them then. <laughs> and I said to the librarian, well, maybe one day I'll write about them and then people will know who they, what they are. So here I am. <laughs> I found out that the 2005 bill failed, which made absolutely no sense. There was no other horse that's been in the state that long. So I decided to find out what happened. We read about them for a while. Um, I was working with Patty Stafford in my office. 
we found out that there was an association planning meeting for Marsh Tacky Horses. And I said, we've got to go. So <laughs> we decided to attend that meeting. In 2007, we went down to Johns Island and I told them, you know, we got to do something. This, this needs to be the state horse. It's the only one that can be the state horse. And so they didn't know who we were, <laughs> but they, they decided we were sincere and wanted me to step in and help them with the state horse bill. I came in and decided, well, we need to choose the reasons why this should be the state horse, get the word out there. We looked around to see what other states had state horses. There were a lot around the South that had state horses. So that was another thing in our argument. I decided to rewrite the bill to try to have it, you know, write it in a way that would be more acceptable. And for, presented it as the um, South Carolina state horse, but later we found out that some people were reluctant to take it as a state horse because other people might you know, get jealous of other horse groups. So we said, well, you know, how about state heritage horse because it is our heritage horse. And I think that's what, one of the things that helped it pass. So of the official state horses, Alabama had the racking horse, Florida had the Florida Cracker Horse. Idaho had the Appaloosa. Kentucky and Maryland shared the Thoroughbred. Massachusetts and Vermont had the Morgan Horse. Missouri had the Fox Trotting Horse. North Dakota had the Nakota Horse. Tennessee had the Tennessee Walking Horse. And North Carolina now has the Spanish Mustang, which became their state horse shortly after the Marsh Tacky became our state horse. So of the House bills, as you see here, we started with three. In 2005, Catherine Sipes introduced the first bill in honor of her father who used to hunt on Marsh Tackies. That bill died in the Invitations and Memorial Resolutions Committee. In 2006, they tried again. That bill died in the Invitations and Memorial Resolutions Committee. In 2007, the next bill went to the Committee on the Ways and Means, but it didn't get much further than that because then it ran into a mule. <laughs> Onto that bill, a mule amendment was added, adding the mule as the state work animal. After that bill was added, people just did not take it seriously. So that bill failed. The next bill came out 2009, and H3044 is the bill that I rewrote. It died in the Invitations and Memorial Resolutions Committee. Are you seeing a pattern here? <laughs> There's a reason for that. We decided to find out why it kept dying in that committee. What we found out was it was dying because of one man. <laughs> and that was Representative Herb Kirsch from Clover, who said that the Marsh Tacky was an ugly horse and he didn't want it on his page of state symbols. Therefore, he was the chair of the committee. He was killing the bill every time, wouldn't even bring it to the floor. So I called Representative Kirsch and talked to him about the horse. And <laughs> he told me it was an ugly horse. I said, well, maybe you, maybe you didn't see a Marsh Tacky. Maybe you saw a bad picture of a Marsh Tacky. I said, let me send you some pictures of Marsh Tacky so you can see what they really look like. He said, I've already seen one. I don't need to see another one. So <laughs> I talked to him about the history of the horse, how it's been here for 500 years how it helped develop our state. He said he didn't care. And I said, well, what if your constituents want the Marsh Tacky to be the state horse? Would you support it then? And he said, no. If they don't like the way I vote, they don't need to vote for me next time. And he said, thank you for calling Little Miss and hung up on me. So, I decided whenever I got a Marsh Tacky mayor, I was going to name her Little Miss. Because <laughs> I wanted her crush to know, don't mess with Little Miss. So to try to get around him, we introduced the identical bill into the Senate. The Senate had no problem with the bill. There were a few little technical issues, a few numbers needed to be changed, nothing major. It went through the Senate. They sent it back to the House for approval, and it went to Invitations and Memorial Resolutions Committee again. 
Again, Herb Kirsch tried to kill the bill. And during that time, he got hurt on, I think it was an escalator, and we were hoping he'd be out for a while, but no, he came back the next day. We had people from all over the state call their representatives and talk to them about the Marsh Tacky because they, you know, we sent, we sent out petitions that didn't really do anything because they wanted people in their, in their areas to support the horse. So we had people from different areas in the state call their representatives. And that's what got this, horse, this bill passed. We were able to pull it out of the committee. We had enough votes in the committee to get it past Herb Kirsch. He was not happy, but we pulled it out of committee and it went back to the House floor. Then it ran into a meal again. <coughs> Representative Kennedy came back again with his mule amendment to make the mule the state work animal. I thought, we're done. It's, it's not going to, it's not going to go anywhere. And there was a ridiculous debate on the state house floor about the mule, which included Jesus, Festus, corn liquor, Clint Eastwood, and a lot of other ridiculous <laughs> items. And that, that debate went on for 20 minutes until it timed out. And I thought, we're done. They, they think it's a joke. So I called everybody. I said, talk to your representatives now. Tell them this is not a joke. This is <laughs> something that we have to get through. It's good for the state. It's good for the horse. It's a living piece of history that we can't let go. So please call them. They did. I think it worked. It got delayed a few times on the House floor, but two days before the end of the session, it finally came back and it came to a vote. That vote passed, 62 yays and 31 nays. So all we needed was the signature of the governor and it was done. And there we are with the bill signed by Governor Sanford. We learned that day that Governor Sanford had grown up with Marsh Tacky horses knew all about them and completely supported our bill. That, that was a great day for all of us. Marsh Tacky was finally the state heritage horse. So today the Marsh Tacky Association exists to get the word out about the Marsh Tacky horse and to keep it going for future generations. Education is a big part of, of our purpose. We do a lot of school visits. A lot of people want to know where you can see Marsh Tackies. We've got several at Brook Ring Gardens that you can see and several at the Coastal Discovery Museum on Hilton Head Island. And we do a lot of community events. So if anyone needs a Marsh Tacky horse, they can just let us know and we can get somebody over to the event. Upcoming events, you just check the Marsh Tacky website, Marsh Tacky Association website, marshtacky.org. All our events will be posted on there. Any questions?